Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll have an uh, event in English today. I uh, hope everybody uh, is capable of the language. Thanks for the distinguished panel, the distinguished speakers, to have come here, to have flown here uh, uh, a long way, and I'm happy to have such a distinguished panel today. Uh, I'd like to don't like to waste your time, so I'll have a quick introduction. Uh, we have the title here, and this is a li little bit of a big roundabout. We'll discuss all the security problems of Israel today here on this panel. So, uh, and we have the best experts that we could get for these issues. The lecture is called. The panel discussion is called Iran: the upheavals in the Middle East, Israel security, and European politics. Uh, I'd like to welcome with you on my right hand side Yossi Merman. Uh, he is uh, a journalist for Haaretz in Israel. He graduated from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. His book on Iran uh, is called The Nuclear Sphinx of Tehran. And next month uh, we will see a new autobiography from him. Uh, about running and politics. At the very end of the table, we have Dr. Emanuele Otto Lenghi. Uh, he's a political scientist, a senior fellow with the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, based in Washington. Uh, he himself is based in Brussels. Uh, previously, he ran the Brussels-based Transatlantic Institute. He has taught at, uh, the, at Oxford University. Uh, and his PhD is from the Hebrew University and he also got a degree from the University of Bologna and his newest book uh, is on the revolutionary regards in Iran it's called the Pastoran uh, if you have a look here uh, thanks for coming Emmanuel And last but not least, uh, from Jerusalem, uh, Mr. Herb Kanon. He's a long-time journalist for the Jerusalem Post. Uh, his current uh, post is called Diplomatic Correspondent for the J Post. Uh, he is originally from Denver, has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Colorado. And his latest book uh, from 2009 has the title Lone Soldiers, Israel Defenders from Around the World. <laughs> and uh, the plan for today is that uh, everybody is talking 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, uh, we start with Yossi and I will do a few questions afterwards, and then uh, the audience is asked to pose your questions, and I hope you have a lot, uh, because these guys can answer the questions you have, I hope. Uh, my name is Michael Spaney, Michael Spaney from the Mid-East Freedom Forum Berlin, an NGO which uh, uh, does policy uh, uh, advising in Berlin. We do also some protest campaigns. We uh, have the Stop the Bomb campaign here in Germany, which was originally done in uh, Austria by Simone Dina Hartmann, who is also here. Uh, and now I'd like to start and to get into the real tough issues of Israel's security problems. And we start with Iran, and Yossi will do his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for uh, coming to this panel. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here. Um, and uh, in the 10 minutes, 12 minutes that uh, are allocated for each of us, I would like to touch upon two major uh, aspects of Israel's uh, foreign and above all security policy. And these are uh, Iran on one hand and Hezbollah on the other and these two issues are obviously interwoven. Um, I was asked to, to, uh, to speak briefly about uh, Iran's nuclear policy and the current uh, situation. Uh, so first of all, I would like I, I would like to say that I'm not sure that there is anyone in the world who really knows what the Iranians are up to, and when 
and even if they have uh, the nuclear bomb. Uh, I have been a, a, um, an old end in this uh, intelligence game from my perspective as a journalist, and I remember that the Israeli intelligence was alarming, warning the world in the mid-90s that Iran would have the bomb within five, six years by the end of the millennium, around 2000. Then they updated and changed their estimate and came to the conclusion that Iran would have the bomb in 2005, 2006. Uh, once again, they updated it, and now the latest, uh, the latest update, and it is shared by uh, both the, the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, not only the Mossad, but also the military intelligence, which is the largest and the more important organ of the Israeli intelligence community than the Mossad. And so the CIA, the Israeli intelligence, came to the conclusion that probably Iran would have uh, would have the capacity, the capability to build its first nuclear device by 2014, 2015, and that was even publicly said and stated by the last head of Mossad, uh, Mr. Mayor Dagan, who just left the service uh, 10, 10 months ago. So, the, the situation in Iran is very ambiguous regarding its nuclear program. It's clear that Iran does want to have the nuclear option. They have tried it for the last 18 years, nearly 20 years, when they reignited the nuclear program after it came to a slow or almost to complete halt after, uh, after, the, uh, after the Islamic Revolution. The, the program was very active and vital uh, during the Shah days. And uh, in my book, The Nuclear Sphinx of Tehran, I interviewed the founder of the I Iranian Atomic Energy uh, Commission, uh, uh, who is in exile in Paris, and he told me on the record that A, he believed that eventually the Shah would like to have a bomb, that his nuclear program was for peaceful purposes, for uh, to build uh, nuclear reactors, uh, for electricity, to generate electricity, but Eventually, he believed that also he would would like to have a bomb. There, that they have the bomb, and that would get them into into problems not only vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Middle East and their and, and their Arab neighbors and and the West, but also vis-a-vis -vis China and, and Russia. Uh, so they can lose by declaring that they have the bomb. If they don't declare that they have the bomb, then what would be the benefits of having the bomb? Uh, First, now, the first uh, reason for Iran to have some problems to, to, to progress with their nuclear program is the sanctions. And I'll touch upon uh, the sanctions later on. The sanctions are not sufficient. They are still weak. But, but despite, the fact, uh, despite that fact, the, the sanctions are, are having some effect on Iran, especially maybe less on the economy, Although also the economy, the Iranian economy suffers from the sanctions, but more importantly, they have difficulties to obtain materials for the nuclear program because of the sanctions and because of the alert, high alert of the international community, the intelligence com agency around the globe, which are shadowing uh, the Iranian nuclear program. And whenever they, they find out that Iran is trying to buy a certain elements that are needed for their nuclear program, immediately they mobilize uh, the local authorities, and that has been happening all the time. We don't hear about it, but it happens all the time. Uh, for example, if the Israeli intelligence or the CIA would know that in Belgium there is a company which is re ready to sell some components which are dual use, they can be used for industry, but or for the uh, chemical industries or other industries in Iran, but also can be used for the nuclear program, they immediately go to the local authorities, to the Belgian government, and they alert them, and the shipments usually is, is stopped. So, Iran, so sanctions are, are having their effect, and uh, 
And then we, we, come to the, we come to the question of sanctions. I said that there is a question regarding, there is a dilemma regarding the political will of Iran, whether to assemble the bomb or not. I talked about the sanctions, uh, about the penetration of Iranian nuclear program by the, uh, by the intelligence communities, uh, various intelligence communities, and now we're dealing with the sanctions. The sanction is like, a, like if you look at, 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 at a half glass of, uh, of water, it, they, they are not sufficient, they are not tough enough, they are weak, but still they are having an effect on Iran, on the economy, especially the unilateral sanctions, not the sanctions that were imposed by the UN, because in the UN, we, in the Security Council, we, we know that there is a problem with Russia and China. Whenever there is a tough, tough, this, the, the, whenever there is a proposal to toughen the sanctions, the Russians and, and the Chinese are, are, are in disagreement and they block any effort to reach an international consensus. But the sanctions are working. And you have to remember that the sanctions are, are added to the, to the economic, social economic problems of Iran. And I'll just name a few of them. Iran, despite its bravado, despite its declarations that it's a strong nation, Iran is a weak nation. Is a corrupt nation. I compare Iran to the Soviet Union. The image of the Soviet Union for many, many years was a strong empire, an evil empire, as uh, Reagan called it, uh, President Reagan. But domestically, it was corrupt. It was rotten from inside. And the same is about Iran. Uh, I don't think that Israel will attack Iran. There is a lot of talking in the media that Israel is going to attack Iranian nuclear installations in order to stop Iran from having the bomb. I don't think, I don't think that Israel would do it. Uh, I don't think that there is a understanding in the Israeli security establishment, the chief of staff, the head of intelligence, and other security organs that this is an advisable tool. Israel prefers that the international community will deal with this problem. And indeed, the international community is dealing with it. And if there is a military uh, option, as a last resort, after sanctions have been exhausted, after, di after the diplomatic pressure doesn't, doesn't work, then we can have the military option on the table. But it should be carried out by the United States. America has, is the only superpower in the world that is capable of conducting an effective military strike against Iran, or an international, a consortium of international, um, of the international community, like the war against Saddam Hussein in 1990. Thank you. Uh, thank you, after Yossi's optimistic uh, uh, take on, on Iran. I want to look for a minute at uh, what's going on in, in the UN. And I have 10 minutes to talk about something which his exercises and which, which drove us nuts for so long, for months in fact, I and mean, think back a couple of months ago, before Gilad Chalit, before we saw what's happening with Gaddafi, and remember how worried we were about what was going to happen this, in, in September. This, this whole thing about September was like this giant monster in Israel, something we talked about, we thought about, we wrote about, we analyzed ad nauseum. So I just want to telegraph a couple of quick points about it. First of all, again, I think as Israelis, as Jews, we have a tendency sometimes to work ourselves into a tizzy. Right? As my kids say, we, we have a tendency to kind of go nuts over things. We, we have a tendency to kind of overblow them to a certain extent. Defense Minister Ehud Barak set the tone on this months ago when he said that Israel faces a diplomatic tsunami at the UN. You remember that comment? It kept coming back and back and back. Right? And then Victor Lieberman, the foreign minister, piled onto this by saying that, it, it, by saying like, it, I think it was about in, in July, he had, a, he had a press briefing, and he said that the events in U, at the UN in September will trigger the worst violence, this is a quote, he said it will trigger the worst violence and spilling of blood that we've ever seen. Everybody thought, pretty much, that in September, Abu Mazen was gonna march into the Security Council, he was marching to the United Nations, and pretty much get his way. You had all those countries who, at Brazil's lead, started already last, last September, they were already recognized in the Palestinian state. You had the automatic majority for the Palestinians in the General Assembly 
<laughs> Sir, you had the U.S. veto in the Security Council, right? This thing wasn't going to go through the Security Council because the U.S. would veto it. But the Palestinians thought they didn't think they would have as much trouble as they are having right now getting nine votes inside the Security Council. The way it works in the Security Council, I'm sure you're aware of this, in order for, for them to be accepted as a, as a member state of the United Nations, they need the recommendation of the Security Council. The U.S. is going to veto it. That's a given. However, in order, the U.S. doesn't want to have to veto it, so the Palestinians need to line up nine out of the 15 states to get this thing and to force a, UN, uh, a U.S. veto. Why do they want a U.S. veto? Because if they have a U.S. veto, they can go to the General Assembly and say, look, the whole world wants this. It's just the, the U.S. and Israel, they're the only ones that don't want it, right? So they, you know, that's, that's what they thought was going to happen. But the developments, it didn't work out. It didn't work out that way. They are having a great deal of difficulty lining up those nine countries. So the U.S., the, 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 we don't always just, you know, it's just that they don't have necessarily the way that we think that they're going to have. And we've never defined adequately what we want. There was a great Middle East theorist by the name of Yogi Berra. He was also a baseball manager for the New York Yankees. And he said, don't be surprised that if you wake up in the morning and you don't know where you're going, that you're not going to get there. And you know what? <laughs> we've not gotten there because we've really never defined, to a large extent, where there, at least in regards to the borders, where there is. The Palestinians did. They defined us. Right? Okay? That's an option. I don't know. I don't know what you're going to do. But if he goes back to violence, again, we're not going to sit on our, our hands. We'll be able, again, to defeat that violence at a cost to both sides. But it's not as if, you know, they go back to violence and we just fall up and say, well, you get whatever you want. Um, things will succeed, and I'll close on this, things will succeed in my mind if the Palestinians realize after all these failed tactics that the only way they're going to get what they want, or some of what they want, much of what they want, most of what they want, is if they compromise a little bit themselves. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I could leave on a more optimistic note. I don't see that happening right now, but who knows? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, you put me in a very difficult and unfair position to have to cover everything from the European perspective. So I have three big issues in 27 countries. <laughs> so if I take an extra minute, you will, uh, you will be lenient on me. I want to make... Uh, two or three points about Europe uh, when it comes to all of these uh, foreign policy challenges. The problem with Europe today is that whereas the total moving 61 was just a you know, great comic uh, relief, today we're going to have to start selling the Trevi Fountain and the Acropolis and various other you know, national jewels for real if we are to survive the financial crisis we're in. In other words, Europe is facing all of these foreign policy challenges, nuclear proliferation in the Middle East, uh, the danger of conflict but between Israelis and Palestinians in the context of regional turmoil and an unprecedented wave of change that we cannot read, at a time of profound structural weakness. We are weak. Not only are we weak, but we are distracted. There is only so much that even the most gifted political leader can take, and our political leaders, forgive me, are not very gifted uh, these days. And there's only so much that a bureaucracy, even a gifted and talented one with a lot of people working on all sorts of uh, crises and challenges in different geographic parts of the world, can absorb. And one of the things that I've heard over and over again from diplomats from various European countries and in Brussels in the last few months, when I, when I go and query them about Iran, they say, you know, Libya, the UDI, which just don't have time. It's beneath the radar. So this is one double problem. The structural weakness, the fact that we can't go and bang our fist on the table with interlocutors across the world because we do not have the power to project right now. We are distracted internally on a huge domestic crisis that could cost uh, the future of Europe uh, very significantly. Um, and there's too much, and we can't take it all and handle it properly. So we're, we're in a very reactive mode, and that's a basic problem. The second point is that even when we have the power and the, 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 the attention span to deal with this crisis, 
there is a tainted philosophical approach when it comes to Europe and the way it sees and it looks at foreign policy challenges in the world. There is a basic failure to confront reality as it is and a lot of wishful thinking. And I want to make a case here, a point about, or illustrate this point by, by saying a word or two about Libya. Nobody in this room, I'm sure, will shed a tear about Gaddafi's premature uh, uh, journey to join the virgins in heaven. Um, but, but think for a second that the mightiest military alliance in history, uh, a coalition of countries whose weaponry and, and, and sophistication in warfare is unprecedented and you know, could take anyone in the world and win, took five months to defeat a ragtag army of a tin pot dictator fighting with rusting Soviet era weapons and without an air force. Now, of course, the NATO people will tell you, look, we'd only committed limited forces, we had a, a limited mandate, you know, the Italians let us fly from there but didn't want to bomb, the Norwegians wanted to bomb but not fly, and this and that and the other, and you know, it was complicated. But what kind of power projection do we have today after it took us five months to get rid of Gaddafi? So, that's, that's the second point. Of course, and set a number of very practical, specific tests. The first is, how do they treat their minorities? A democracy that allows the police to stand on the side when a Christian minority is massacred is not a democracy. Okay? So that's the first point. The second is women's status. There is no such thing as a democracy where women are second-class citizens. So, again, if they mistreat the women, if they pass legislation that reduces the chances for women to have an equal opportunity in the political system, if women are abused and they have no recourse in the judicial system and with the police and so on and so forth, that is not a democracy. But that doesn't mean anything. The people that Israel fights are worse jerks. And that is the point. Show who they are. Show what they do in their countries. Show how they treat their women. Show how they treat their minorities. Show how they are constantly preparing for war. Show how corrupt they are. Show how damaging their, their policies are to the environment. Don't talk about Israel. Talk about its enemies. That way, you will win the argument. Thank you. Would it be helpful if the EU, or the, at least the great powers in the EU, uh, will put a more focus on the accountability in foreign aid regarding the Palestinians? Uh, if there would be pressure on Abbas uh, regarding money, which the U.S. Congress did at the moment, uh, would this be helpful bringing Abbas back to the negotiation table? Uh, did you see any of those pressure measures behind the scenes that we don't see in the open media? Uh, would it be helpful? Would it bring Abbas back to the table? Uh, or is this, in any case, unthinkable? Uh, to both of you. <laughs> Look, and, and that's an interesting question because we see this very much in front of us with the Congress and, and, and the Congress threatening to cut off their aid to the Palestinians. And I don't think that necessarily bothers the Palestinians. Could you much go a bit closer to the room? The, the uh, we see this, the whole thing with the aid coming up very much in Washington with, with the Congress saying that they're going to cut off the aid if they go ahead with this unilateral thing. I'm not sure that that necessarily bothers the Palestinians because they, they think that they'll pick up the aid from, uh, from, from the Europeans. But there's a debate in Israel about whether this is, whether this is the right thing to do. Israel, if you, if you pay attention, Israel hasn't come out square behind this thing because they're worried that if they cut off the funds, then the Palestinian security apparatus isn't going to be doing what they've been doing up until this point, which is to provide a certain degree of security. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword that if, if you don't use it wisely, it could, could come up and actually hit you in the face. Uh, you, have to, you have to use these, these, these levers I think very uh, in, 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 a, in a very balanced measure. And again, I think it's I think it's interesting to note that the Prime Minister Netanyahu, when the Congress came in August and asked him whether they should go ahead with this bill, said, "Let's wait and see what happens." He did put his full force behind it. I just want to add a point and draw an example from a slightly different arena. 
What's the name of that guy who rules France was very short Napoleon? <laughs> he wanted the Palestinian state declared in the lack. He thought it was a great idea for France to take over the the, the brief from the US, you know, snatch it away from the Americans and you know show the grandeur of France. So the Americans said, okay, if you declare we're going to cut funding uh, to UNESCO because you know UNESCO has just accepted the Palestinians as a as a state. So all of a sudden, France realizes that without American money to fund UNESCO, that great uh, sign of prestige that France has to have UNESCO in Paris becomes a huge liability because they won't be able to pay the bills. So they sort of backtrack on the issue. This is how you use the money. Not, you don't stop the funding, but you use it as a pressure tool. First of all, you use public outcry on the misuse of funds to force politicians to be accountable to the public. And second, you use it to pressure politicians to ask tough questions and to impose stringent criteria for giving money to the recipients of that funding. I don't want the Palestinians to, to stop receiving European money, but the amount of European money that they're receiving is significant, and it comes often without strings attached. And if you start putting conditions and threatening to withdraw if those conditions are not met, the recipients hopefully will behave more responsibly. The choices that Israel is facing are not between good and better. They are between bad and worse. So if we don't deal with the PLO or the Palestinian Authority, we would have to eventually to deal with Hamas, which is a lost case because they don't recognize the right of Israel to exist. And eventually, even if we don't deal with Hamas at the end, we would have to deal with Al-Qaeda. So, we have to be very, very careful about the way we structure these attitudes. And if the Palestinian Authority collapses, and, and Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, is threatening, as he, as he said, to return the keys, uh, that eventually we would have to deal with it. We would have to return the military administration to the territories, because someone has to take care of, of sewer and water and uh, and energy supply and food. Now it is carried out by, by the Palestinian Authority. We have been responsible for it until 1993, and until the Oslo Accord. So we have to be very, very careful about the way we, 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 uh, we put it. And don't forget that the Israeli-Palestinian uh, game is not a, a zero-sum game. It's not if we lose, they win. This is not the case, because we have a tremendous problem facing us, and everyone has been ignoring this problem. This is the demographic problem. What we are going to do if we want to maintain the character and the traits of Israel as a Jewish democratic state, what are we going to do with 3-4 million Palestinians on top of the problems we are having already with our, our Arab-Israeli citizens, which are a minority, and there is a growing tendency among them to be more Palestinian than the Palestinians. Thank you. I give the discussion to the audience now, and there's a question there, uh, and I may ask to speak a little bit, bit, bit up, uh, and then you, it's and then uh, you. Referring to the last uh, two discussion points, I feel, no, it's okay. Can everybody uh, hear? Yes, sure. Um, I feel, and I'd like to ask Emanuela, that uh, it's possibly more advisable to give hundreds of millions of dollars, euros, to a democratic state, i.e. Israel, than uh, the European Union, or I think Britain did, uh, giving the rebels who had still not captured Mr. Arden, had still not captured Sirte in uh, Libya, <coughs> I think six weeks ago, and they gave them 100 million. So, uh, as you say, you need a, a, a toolbox to decide what people are doing with huge amounts of money. Uh, you're throwing money at people who you don't even know what they're going to do with the country. So I would like to just say I agree with you. Uh, would you use the mic? We, we need the, uh, also the audience comments on the videotape, I think. So please use the mic. Shalom. First of all, thank you for organizing all this and for your statements. Um, strangely, nobody spoke about Russia. Uh, Mr. Melman mentioned that uh, Russia is not helping in the Iran blockade on, on the way to the bomb. 
And I would appreciate it a lot if you would be so kind to tell us what is the reason, according to your view, why Russia under Putin is not uh, in danger from an atomic bomb in Iran combined with missiles. They reach Moscow, not less than Jerusalem. And uh, just one sentence to the foreign aid. I personally, as an Israeli, do not understand why Europe does not refer the Palestinians to Saudi Arabia to get money there. Saudi Arabia has more money than you do, at least today. Let's <laughs> the, the next question, the, the gentleman in the front row. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talks you all delivered. Um, my question is to Mr. Melman. Um, you just mentioned that, um, that Iran is a weak country. You mentioned the corruption, which is definitely true. But you also mentioned that the Iranians um, simply want something like regime change. This is something we see in the West in 33 years. We ask, we ask ourselves every year um, whether the regime will survive until the next year. I would like to know how do you assess the Iranian view, because especially since 2009, um, many people ask themselves, is that true? Is it true that, we, that, that the Iranians want to have this regime change because we say this since uh, 33 years, and there were um, surveys conducted, mainly by the uh, University of Maryland, but also Globescan or Gallup, all those famous ones, Zogby International. And um, the results of this, um, of, this, of this service don't show any, any attitude to regime change. So I would like to know, how do you assess the view from the Iranian view, while we mostly in Europe only assess, or let's say based on exile views, exile media, we never travel Iran, mostly of those people who are considered as dissidents here in Europe don't travel around, but we say since 33 years, like, um, people want regime change, don't you think that is maybe somehow wishful thinking, or, or that our debate is uh, very often driven by this wishful thinking, because we want the regime change, and we somehow try to interpret this for the Iranians as well, so we have it easier to push for these policies. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we well, well I, I based my analysis I, I haven't been to Iran, and I don't. I have no intentions of traveling to Iran. Because if I travel to Iran, I'd be hanged in in Tehran as a as a Haaretz lefty or an Israeli spy. Uh, regardless of my views, both, both. Uh, but I, I'm basing. I I'm basing my an analysis first on history. <laughs> you look at history; all the dictators are going down eventually. The the Soviet Union. Uh, what you see in the Arab world, Saddam Hussein, doesn't matter if it happened with the intervention of American forces, but if you look at Gaddafi, I think Assad days are also numbered, even if he survives. So th that's, and on the indicators, look at the, at the state of Iran, you know, high prostitution, drugs, corruption, uh, in the very nice way, anecdotal way that Emmanuel described the Pastoran as a, as a mafia kind of organization. Uh, you, unemployment. You know that there are every year half million Iranians, especially young Iranians, who would like to leave the country. But they, they apply for foreign visas and only, only one third of them get them. So Iran, I don't see how such a country can, can, can eventually survive. On top of that, we saw the results of the last elections. The, the, the opposition won the elections, basically, and the, the elections were stolen. Now, don't misunderstand me. I mean, as I said, the, 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 the choices between uh, uh, facing Israel vis-a-vis -vis Iran are also are not between good and better. I mean, it was Rafsanjani, you know, the darling of the West, the hero of the West, the great white hope of the West in Iran, Rafsanjani, yeah, the former president, the former speaker of the parliament, who said, in two, I think it was 2000 or 2001, that all it needs is one bomb to drop over Israel and Israel is, is finished. So it wasn't Ahmadinejad who actually ever threatened to use a bomb against Israel. Ahmadinejad was careful enough to say that he doesn't want to see Israel, that Israel should be whipped out of the map of the world, but he never said that he would drop a bomb on Israel. It was Rafsanjani who said it. Musawi, you know, the, the leader of the Iranian liberal green movement, 
He was the initiator as a prime minister of the Iranian nuclear program in the 80s, uh, 90s, uh, early 90s. So it's much more complex, but I, with all these indicators and history on our side, not as a hand of history, but as a, as a historical lesson, I think the, the Iranian regime eventually will be finished. What will become out of it? I don't know. Maybe the, Iran will disintegrate into a Kurdish country, a state, into an Azari state, or, or whatever. But I think that it's not based on just wishful thinking. I don't trust, I don't rely, I don't believe that the Iranian opposition, these exiled groups that are abroad, Mujahideen Khalq, or, or the Kurdish party, or, or the Green Movement, are, are those who would make the change. No way. These groups, exiled groups, are, or the royalists, you know, that are based mainly around the television studio in Los Angeles. Uh, I don't think that the rescue and, and, uh, and will come from these quarters, but it will come from inside, because the Iranian people have enough of the regime, and the regime knows it. Your question? Uh, what about my question concerning Russia? Ah, yes. All the three did not answer. Coming to the next one. I, 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 I would think that Putin perhaps is too dangerous. I, I, will be very, I will be very sure. The Russians are scared to death about an Iranian bomb. They will not have they will not let Iran have a bomb, but at the same time they have trade relations and they and they want to sell uh, more nuclear reactors to to Iran. And half jokingly, I would say that the Iranians, uh, the Russians, would not object if the Bushehr nuclear reactor is going to be attacked because then they, the Iranians will ask them to build a new one. So why not? That's the basically that's the Iranian policy. On top of that, they do the opposite what the Americans are doing. That's what I would say. I, mean, I think you have, to, you have to look at Russia's policy towards Israel and towards Iran into doing what America doesn't do in order to, to kind of you know, put themselves on the stage. It's a zero-sum game for them. And they're also racist about Iranian capability, scientific capabilities. They dismiss the ability of these colored people to be able to succeed in the technology that you know, white Slavs have uh, mastered so long ago. I've heard it from Russian immigrants. They dismiss and therefore, they say, you know, why should we not play the great game in Iran when, after all, the Iranians will never get there? <laughs> I'm serious. The you can quote me on that. <laughs> the gentleman in the third row, please. I just want to make a, a comment to uh, what Emmanuel Alcalani said. Uh, I think uh, it's not easy to express, but. Uh, just as I was uh, yesterday in Mainz, and there some people told me in the market where uh, here the, the leadership of the city is for 50 or 60 years in the SP, in the, in the, in the, on the left. And uh, just as this is the case, I think basically that the policy circles, the, the most important people <coughs> who, who matter uh, in Europe are so entrenched in their in their nihilistic worldview that I don't think they will be able to change in the, for, in, for the future. You, you bring up, uh, you bring up uh, methods and, uh, and tactics how to effect change by us lay people and uh, I'm much more pessimistic on this because I, I think that they are simply too entrenched in their skewed and stupid worldviews and uh, there's nothing uh, short of a <laughs> no, I don't want to use a drastic term, but a revolution. But I, I don't think that they they, they they are changeable. Their their mind is made up uh, because they are from the 68 generation, and until they basically leave this world, there will not be any change. And they will uh, play their you stupid games the with the Palestinians, <laughs> and they will play their stupid games with with everybody else. Uh, I'd like to connect another question from this gentleman, please. Very good uh, picture from the Middle East, from all the three, but uh, we uh, forgot one uh, country, it's Iraq. Um, um, the Americans will uh, leave soon Iraq, and uh, uh, what do you think it will uh, change the situation in Iraq and, and the, in the other countries, or not? Uh, I just have a very quick question. Um, 
And that would be, uh, what uh, would you suggest to the to European governments? Uh, which steps should they take in order to uh, pressure to toughen the pressure against Iran? So we have two questions on the EU, uh, as I said, and, and, and Iraq. Uh, who I answer Iran. Look, Iran already is not one homogeneous country. It's a federated country with three basic elements. There is a Kurdish state up in the north, almost independent, almost. Uh, in deep troubles vis-a-vis -vis the Turks, the Kurds and all that. Then you have the Shiites. So far, the Shiites have, have restrained themselves, uh, partly by orders from Tehran, partly by their own leadership. And then you have the Sunnites which is the, uh, around the triangle in, 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 in Baghdad. Uh, when the Americans withdraw, it, even if it's not a zero-sum game, obviously Iran would, 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 would be beneficial from the situation. Now, there are differences between the Iraqi Shiites and the Iranian Shiites. It's not that the, Iran, the Iraqi Shiites and their especially religious leadership are marching to the drums of, of Tehran. No, there is a great deal of disagreement, the, uh, uh, religious disagreement, political and so on. But all in all, yes, Iran would have, in that relation, would have the upper end. Uh, Iran, Iraq would be weakened. We may see the return of some sorts of Al-Qaeda kind of uh, operations. Uh, although the Americans, uh, I think, uh, managed to 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 to, uh, to crash the Al Qaeda uh, presence in Iraq, um, the Kurds would even be less um, tolerant uh, um, and accommodating vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the central government of Baghdad. So there is there is a bleak future for Iraq, but. But it's not the end of Iraq as a, as a country. Uh, I think that despite the withdrawal of the Americans, which would be gradual and still they would have a great deal of, of influence and presence there, not uh, an, an economic uh, uh, infrastructure. So I think Iran as a modern country would, would, would survive the pressures, but Iran would, at least in the short term, uh, would come would come out of the situation with with the feeling that uh, they maybe won the, the the battle or the war uh, with, with in these relations with America and Iran. Can I just add to that, right? Of I, I think one, one thing this does though it adds the whole sense, at least in Jerusalem, of chaos in the region. Uh, and we don't like chaos. Chaos is bad. Chaos is unpredictable. And I think you have to ask the question: What? The developments on Iraq, what impact is that going to have on Jordan? Right? And that has a huge impact on us. Yeah. Yes. Don't you think that mm -hmm. if the US leaves it's, it's Iraq, we US will not do anything toward Iraq toward Iran? That's we are talking about Iran. That's, that's, a, good, point. that's a good point. That's they, a good point. They have, they have that's to a pay, point. They have to pay a, a some trillion dollar deficit and uh, public debt and uh, win win the election. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I, I think your point is, is, is important because I don't know exactly what's going to happen to Iraq, but the, the real issue here is the decline of American power and influence, which we can discuss and, and disagree about whether it's inevitable or whether this administration is, is resigned to it, and, but this is part of what is happening. There is a void of power in the region. And, you know, that 68th generation that is ruling Europe, uh, and, and their mind could not be changed. You know, 10 years ago, they were all talking about l'hyperpuissance de l'Amérique, you know, the super, the American hyperpower, as if this was, you know, the plague. And now they're all shaking, saying, oh my gosh, America is not powerful anymore. What are we going to do? It's up to us. We can do it on our own. You know, this, this whole thing of leading from behind, you know, we would like you to lead from, from, from ahead. <laughs> so even these people will change their mind because the loss of American power creates chaos, certainly in the region. And, and I think this is, uh, this is something that we're going to, uh, to have to contend with for many years to come. And nothing good can come out of that.
I would like to ask Herb, uh, in what way is it viewed in Jerusalem uh, when you look on Europe from Israel, uh, the zigzagging, the appeasement, the dialogue which is of the European uh, Union, talking with Iranians, having Iranian uh, business delegations being uh, brought into Europe on a daily basis. Uh, is from Israel's perspective, is there a, a wish to have more rigorous, uh, more united approach, or uh, how do the uh, administration people in Israel deal with that problem of the not united 27 EU countries? I think, I think I mean, at least at the UN, I think they've been trying to leverage it into Israel's favor, right? Uh, you know, the, whole, the whole battle of, of is the EU going to come out with a united voice on the whole the Palestinian thing, I think from Israel's perspective, once Germany came out and said they're going to vote against it, right? That's 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 something that's something that's, that's good because it's kind of a divide and conquer type of thing, right? If, if on the one hand you say that you got to have a unified voice, and then a key country like Germany comes out and says we're not going to vote for it, well that's good, and, and the fact that the, 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 the EU is not going to want to put out or at least theoretically is not going to want to come out with a, a divided voice on that is something that Israel. Israel plays, it's, it's, Israel plays countries against each other, and I think many times to the anger of the Europeans. But it's, it's, it's something they used to their benefit. Thank you for this statement. Uh, I, I think we're running out of time, and I think we have to go back soon. I would uh, like to give the uh, panel a little chance of a final statement. Uh, uh, I would start with Yossi. Um, I didn't touch upon Hezbollah, and I would say something which is um, in contrast to the uh, convention wisdom regarding uh, the Israeli-Hezbollah uh, conflict. Uh, I think that, that, that Israel, uh, if not won the war of 2006, at least inflicted a great deal of damage on Hezbollah. And basically, it was the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, who admitted that. But then he said, he, he said basically that had I known that that would be the result of, of the kidnapping of the two Israeli soldiers and I would see the Israeli retaliation, I wouldn't do it. And I also know from intelligence sources that he was bashed by the Iranians, his, his, his controllers from the Al-Quds force, for doing it, for exposing Iranian tactics uh, and exposing the Iranian alliance with Hezbollah and their missiles and, and so on. The bombing, because the Arabs, the Sunnites, wanted Israel to destroy Hezbollah. And actually, they were kind of frustrated that we didn't inflict too much damage, uh, a greater damage on, the, on, on Hezbollah. And, and thirdly, I think that the elimination of their defense minister, their arch terrorist, the master terrorist, Imad Murnia in, in Damascus in 2008, which is attributed to the Israeli Mossad, uh, was also a kind of a of a landmark uh, uh, event. The right hand man of, of, of Nasrallah was killed. The message to Nasrallah was, if we got him, we can get you. So all in all, I think Israel has now having five years of, of, of peace in, in the north. Uh, tourism is flourishing. The international community is behind Israel vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah. And now with the with the coming report uh, by the UN uh, Special Tri Tribunal on the killing of Rafik al-Khariri, the former Prime Minister, which was conducted, executed by Hezbollah, in the, probably by the orders of, of Syria, uh, Hezbollah would be even under more, uh, more pressure by the international community because they would be accused of killing an, uh, an, an Lebanese their Prime Minister, and the other elements, the other ethnic minorities in, in, in Lebanon would also uh, realize that if they didn't realize so far the Christian, the Druze, that Hezbollah is their enemy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yossi and I'll pass the word on to her. Uh, yeah, I, just, I mean, just within the, the framework of final comments, I'd pick up on what Yossi says, and, I, 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 and, and actually leave with a, a kind of an optimistic thought. I don't think that things are as bad as they oftentimes appear. Uh, I think we live from headline to headline, and you look out there and you could scream, could vault, the world's falling apart, the world is falling apart. I mean, we're Jews, we fret, right? We, we fret, therefore we are. There's definitely what to fret about, 
but I think we have to put it in perspective. With all the challenges that are out there, we still remain the most powerful military and economic country in the region, and we do have an ability to find short-term solutions to problems. Right? We don't find good long-term solutions necessarily, but if we throw a problem at the country, it deals with it not half bad. Look at how we brought down the, the terrorism from the Intifada. It was a great thing I, I, I read once about a guy who goes to America and he goes to the American. This just, just kind of illustrates how Israel deals wonderfully with the short term, but not so great with the long term. A guy comes to America and he says, build me a rocket to take me to Mars. Then he goes to Washington, he goes to uh, NASA, he goes to Huntsville, Alabama. Within 15 years, the Americans have a, miss uh, have a rocket that takes the gentleman to Mars and brings it back. He goes to Israel, he goes to the IDF, he goes to the Technion, he says, bring me, a, build me a rocket to take me to Mars. Within three years, the Israelis have a rocket to take them to Mars. Doesn't bring them back, but it gets them to Mars. And I think that kind of that, that sums up the way we deal with problems. We deal with the short term. You look at the whole Gilad Shalit thing. We deal with the short term. But as far as dealing with the short term, we do it not half bad. And I think it's important, oftentimes, instead of getting drowned in the headlines, to keep that in mind. Thank you for this humorous little statement, uh, now Emmanuel Williams. Since I spoke so much, I, I just want to make one very short final point, and th that is to go back to how Yossi uh, opened uh, his remarks at the beginning of the session about, you know, the changing estimate of Iran's uh, uh, nuclear uh, timeline, and uh, he mentioned now uh, uh, the the the, the, the uh, premature death of uh, Imad Mukhnia. You know, when he died, he was about, I think, 45. So if his estimated life expectancy was 75.4. But after he died, we had to change that estimate. And this is the point about Iran's nuclear program and all, all of these challenges, even the stubborn 68 generation that keeps seeing the world in, in a very twisted, uh, topsy-turvy fashion. The fact that these challenges are extremely difficult <coughs> does not excuse us from taking them on. And the facts that we have at hand, and, and, and the fact that Iran in 2011 still hasn't managed to cross the finish line, is a testament and a testimony to the fact that if we all do our part and are creative about these things, Israelis are creative about Ikhmad Mukhmi and the other nuclear scientists in Iran, and we are creative about you know, other things that are perhaps less dramatic but still effective, we can affect change for the better. And that is the task of people who are committed to advocacy. You can convince politicians and decision makers to change direction in a way that helps delay the worst possible scenario and hopefully brings the better one to fruition. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Emanuele. Thank you, Herb. Thank you, Yossi. Uh, thank you for being here and listening to us. Uh, I hope you enjoy the conference uh, as it goes along. Uh, we will find us in the uh, big hall. Thank you very much for coming here. See you next week.